as I say, the most important aspect that I believe people have to understand about my artwork is um, the social, social history and the social environment in which I grew up, right? So, and I'm talking about the apartheid history, and I'm talking about my experience of how this social system affected my family especially, because this was actually the main, when I spoke earlier about trauma and so on, this is where the trauma that I'm talking about comes from and originates. Um, so, as I became adult and could think about things in a particular way, I began to analyze myself uh, in terms of this particular history. And I wanted to, I, I didn't believe that I had a very unique experience coming out of apartheid. So I had the desire to share and communicate these things and these feelings that I experienced. I wanted to communicate these in my artwork. I wanted my artwork to be a vehicle of communication about this, this side of being a South African person growing up in um, during the apartheid times and the consequences of this kind of social environment, um, the consequences that it has on families and individuals and 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 if you and understanding these consequences to then know how to deal with these consequences, to be able to communicate to the powers that be that um, this is what, you know, trauma is, because trauma isn't just what happens to you, yeah? Trauma is what happens to you on the inside, you know? Trauma is not just being hit over the head, but what that does to you emotionally. That for me is trauma, that's the trauma that I'm talking about. So. My art has always been geared towards communicating this kind of trauma, but, but more than that, more than just communicating to the outside world, um, it was about um, the sense of healing that I needed for my own spiritual life. Um, so when I became, when I started the early steps of being a, a serious artist, uh, what, I, what, I, what I did was I, I began to be seriously interested in, in all forms of history, especially our local history. Um, and I wanted, and because South Africa at that time um, was a socially engineered society, so that everyone was divided into groups, um, I was especially interested in my particular group um, the history, because if I could understand that, I could understand first of all my trauma, I could understand my, uh, my community in which I grew, um, live, and then I could understand how to actually deal or, or, or coexist with other communities that we were separated from. So I, I wanted my artwork to have that sort of power that uh, people can take from. I wanted my work to be able to communicate these things instantly. So uh, later on, I began to have texts in my work um, because a lot of the, the aspects of history that I'm talking about is a history that was completely not known by the ordinary person. This is the history that I'm talking about, actually. I'm not talking about the conventional history that everybody knows about. I'm talking about the hidden history. And there again, it's museums play a very, very, or played a very important role in my life because I found these, I found out about this or these kinds of histories within the walls of museums, small town museums, uh, big city museums, and so on and so on. Um, so in my work, I like to illuminate events in history, individuals in history, um, circumstances in history that has been hidden from view. In the art world, um, there's a kind of a catchphrase that 
a lot of artists are really into uh, today, and that is identity politics, you know. Um, I believe that it's still important in South Africa up to this point. Um, we are still an imperfect society, so I believe that if we deal with all these issues from the past, we will somehow make a way to create a future that we actually want for ourselves and our children. Nineteen eighty-nine. Um, the work was called Subject to Change. And it is a big work that consisted of two big panels next to one another. Um, I think that if one looking at the work, I think the analysis of the work must come from the title that I chose, which is Subject to Change which means that something is going to change, it's not going to stay the same, that something has the potential to change. Um, and there can, be, there can be more interpretations of the, the phrase subject to change. But 1980, 1989, in fact, the entire 80s, is a very important era in the history of South Africa. Um, firstly, the 1980s can be divided right in down the middle in 1985 was the state of emergency, which is a very important event for me personally and the country, I suppose. But at that particular time, I was exclusively interested only in highly politicized work, political work. Um, in fact, I would say um, that, that all the work that I was doing was like closely linked to the underground um, activities of the ANC at that particular time, because we were all sort of underground at that particular time, even us as artists, we weren't really part of the gallery system, so we had to create our own method of survival. But being around these circles in the 1980s, these the political circles, uh, round about 1988, I think, um, we began to hear rumors in the underground that the nationalist government were thinking of freeing Nelson Mandela. They were beginning, they were thinking of having talks with him. They were thinking of a new kind of relationship with the ANC, all right? Because there was this new um, generation of Africana people uh, coming through who were thinking differently to the old, older folk at that time. And when I first heard about this news, I thought, okay, no, that, it could be possible, it, it's, it's feasible and reasonable to, to make these assumptions. Maybe there is something to these rumors. And then I began to ask myself the question, but now hang on, just hang on one minute. If it means that Nelson Mandela is going to be released and the ANC is going to be unbanned and there's going to be no more of this kind of politics, then what is the relevance to all the art that you've done up until that point, right? It's going to be irrelevant. You can't just do political work all the time and now you have this event that throws you off balance. And so I pose that question to myself and I, I it sort of created this question like, what art would you do if the society was free? because maybe that is going to be the, the immediate future. And the work subject to change was born out of this question. Um, I decided that um, in this work, I wanted to finally cut myself off from this political work um, because 
I was already fed up with political work at that particular point because it didn't, it doesn't satisfy one spiritually, you know, political work. It's, it's got nothing to do with your own um, spiritual identity. It's got to do with reactive, um, being reactive to things that happen outside of your little, little world, you know. I decided that in this work, I'm going to, I'm going to load it with all the kind of classical images that I had built up as a personal vocabulary in my life. I'm going to load it into this work. And from as soon as that is done, it's going to be a moment of catharsis. I'm going to be done with political work now. I'm going to move on to the work that is closer in uh, importance to my emotional side, my spiritual side, my inner being. Because um, I, I, I believed at that particular point that I still had not created art that was personal. I have a, I have a sense of art history. I have, a, I have a sense of all the great artists in the world. Um, I have a sense of that, that world, right? And I wouldn't say that you, you want to be part of that world, but you have a sense of how what the appreciation of art is all about in terms of history and what works, what artworks linger longer in, in the memories of, of, of our existence, you know. At that particular point I could, I recognize that if I didn't start my, doing my own personal work now, work that really meant something to me personally, that I was on the wrong course. And that's why I did that particular work. There are too many images in this work to be able to actually just name a few, right? Um, but the work, when, um, when, 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 in 1990, when 1994 came along and all those things happened, actually the Nelson Mandela was released, the ANC was unbanned, 1984 came along, the Freedom Era came along, and so South Africa as a country was opened up to the world after 1994. And um, that also applied to the art world. The, the overseas, the people who were interested in art from overseas, uh, I'm sure they were interested in what sort of art was produced here in, this, in, in South Africa pre-1994. Because if you remember, South Africa was under a cultural, a United Nations cultural boycott. So none of our creativity actually, I believe, was being uh, seen in the world and nothing of the outside world was coming in. So it was very much a dark kind of country uh, in terms of that. But when everything opened up after 1994, South Africa was really flooded by people who were interested in what kind of art had been produced, or curators from overseas um, were, were arriving here all the time, you know. Um, and it was, one of these curators was the curator of the Smithsonian Museum of African Art in Washington. And they are the people who bought that work. And that is where the work resides. Um, the work had a very, very good reception, I remember. Um, um, the Smithsonian actually used images of the work for a lot of their media immediately after they had purchased the work. Um, there were posters made, there were t-shirts made, there were all manner of things were, you know, made use of uh, fr from the images of that particular work. So it's, 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 it's easily the one that really stands out for me the most. I've, I've, I've always been a person that, that had a high sense of experimentation and I've always wanted to develop materials other than just the classic materials that one would get. Um, so I always had this uh, habit way back even to always um, mix things into my paints, for example, you know, mix uh, sand and stuff into my paint, always trying to, trying to just find out what, what, what can one do with materials. 
Um, so I, I've spent um, a lot of time developing my own materials um, and methods of painting. I've developed um, working with sand now um, in a very interesting way. Um, I've developed a way of um, creating a two-dimensional surface with sand using glues and so on and building up layers of sand on a two-dimensional surface and then carving into the sand whatever imagery I would want. Um, so what happens with this particular method and material is that sand is of course a highly textured um, material, right? So when you carve into it, you create more textures, uh, depths, uh, heights, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, mountains and valleys and you know, those kinds of uh, shapes um, or feeling or textural or or surface quality. So when you apply light onto this surface, particularly in very dark uh, uh, surroundings, um, when you apply light onto it and shine it in a particular direction, all these, all the heightened areas of the texture becomes even more highlighted and so the work almost reveals itself. If you can imagine, there's just sand, so all, it's all just a monochrome color, right? But when you put light onto it, and it's very dark, all the surface textures suddenly come alive, and the work reveals itself, and it becomes almost a new work. Now this is a, a, a material that I'm developing right now at this moment and I'm right in the middle of taking it in a particular direction which I don't know where it's going to go but more or less along these kinds of lines. In my opinion it's one of the important early ones that I have. When I started becoming interested in the post-political work um, one of those, one of the things I did was to go deeper into this whole aspect of identity issues and how it, how it's affected by the South African situation and the South African history and so on and so on. And being, um, having been brought up in an apartheid system with, in, with divided communities and racially based identity markers. These are the things that interested me. So for example, I'm talking about the colored community and the colored identity as it relates to our history and our country and our society. Um, and I became particularly interested in the indigenous um, character of the colored community. And I'm speaking particularly about the Khoi San indigenous identity. This became um, the thing that took over my entire imagination because I could really feed off all the, uh, all the new things that I was learning out of my research. I could feed off this and it became a constant fountain of inspiration for me. Rimfas Mark is one of those moments of, of, of inspiration that I'm talking about. Um, as I said, one of the things that I wanted to do in my work was highlight specific things like place names, events, um, individuals, personalities, and so on and so on. Um, Rimfas Mark is a place name in South Africa and it has a particularly kind of very, very painful history related to this indigenous past that I'm talking about. Um, the other aspect of Rimfasmark, the word, is that actual name. It's such a fascinating uh, 
Afrikaans word for me, you know, and, and it is loaded with the potential for all kinds of creative interpretation. And this is, wh this is what I was doing with this. Because in one sense, Rinfasmark means to tie something very securely. Now, the, the positivity in the name does not tell you the truth about the history of this community which is completely torn apart, right? Um, in other words, I believe that this community came up with a name that did not reflect the history of that particular place. Um, but in a way it did because um, it was a way of surviving out of having nothing. What would you do? You would you would dream fast, Mark, right? You would, you would, you would, you would like be creative. And let's say you don't have a, a, a place to say, a place to stay. You would have to make a place to stay, and you would have to um, take branches and and, and 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 fasten them and create a house out of nothing. So these are all the kinds of things that the, the, the word Rimfasmark and the name Rimfasmark has. Um, in, in the case of this uh, community. Um, and the other reason why I particularly want to highlight this work is that it contains some of the materials that, that I was beginning to use for the first time and which would later on take over all the materials um, or my, my, my preferred materials later on. So for the first time, I was really experimenting with sand and trying to sort of like really just find out what sand can do as a, as a material. So this, for example, is colored sand, sand that I colored, and this is plain sand. And I think, and this is, this is sand mixed into the paint and for the name, so that the name is slightly um, heightened. It has a textural um, character to it. Um, but I can, I can already begin to see, I can, I can see what I was trying to do. I was trying to see what now, what can the sand do? Um, I can see that it can be used just as it's on its own. And what would that be like? If I painted it a color, what would that be like? How would the sand interact with the paint? And so on and so on and so on.